Okay, everyone. So we are going to get started now. Just a quick note, this session will is being recorded. Your cameras and microphones are turned off and won't be available during the webinar. If you want to ask a question, you can put it in the Q&A section below, and we will try and answer as many as possible. I want to thank everyone for coming today and also for your support of CCLA. You make our work possible, so thank you. My name is Michael Lowry, and I am the Annual Fund Manager here at CCLA. We are excited to have with us today Noah Mendelson Aviv and Kara Faith Liebel. Now I'd like to hand over to Noah Mendelson Aviv, um, our Executive Director and General Counsel uh, for Canadian Civil Liberties Association. Um, in her 20 years at CCLA, Noah has written, appeared, and advocated on many equality, freedom of religion, and freedom of expression issues. Noah obtained her LLB and LLM cum laude from the, here, from the Hebrew University and worked in both civil liberties and private legal practice in Jerusalem. So here is Noah Mendelssohn Abib. Thank you, Michael. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. I am delighted that so many of you have joined us today. Ten months ago, as many of you know, the federal government invoked the Emergencies Act and handed itself enormous powers, which you're going to hear about in just a bit. Since that day, CCLA has been speaking out to inform and engage people across this country so that they can understand our concerns and so that the government knows that our independent watchdog organization and so many of you are watching and will hold them to account. Before we get right into it, I would like to recognize that many of us are joining from different locations on many different Indigenous lands across Canada. I am speaking from Toronto, which is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And it is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. In the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge the land that Indigenous peoples have lived on and taken care of for over 10,000 years. And before we go to Kara, as promised, here are some highlights of CCLA's work over the past year. First of all, our privacy program has been extremely busy with, first of all, spyware. The RCMP was found to be secretly using spyware. These are on-device investigative tools that can remotely collect texts, emails, even turn on microphones and cameras. CCLA raised the alarm, speaking out in public and before a parliamentary committee to discuss the risks to privacy and online security and how this issue contributes to an international industry that is known for assisting authoritarian government surveillance of lawyers, political opponents, and human rights defenders. Our privacy program has been busy with facial recognition technologies, what we call facial fingerprinting, a form of biometric identification. This discriminates against racializing individuals and ubiquitous identification would negatively impact freedom of expression, association and assembly, the right to be free from unreasonable search and seizure and rights to liberty and security of the person. We made submissions and recommendations to a parliamentary committee studying this subject. Our privacy, uh, our privacy pro program has also been busy with Bill C-26, a cybersecurity bill. We co-authored a letter to the Minister of Public Safety and argued that the bill undermines privacy rights and the principles of accountable governance and judicial due process, which are the fabric of Canadian democracy. As well, Bill S-7, there too, we made submissions and recommendations. We're researching, we're responding. S-7 is about border searches of electronic devices, and Bill C-27 is about privacy in the commercial sphere. On a different tack, a few weeks ago, the Ontario government introduced Bill 28 and invoked the notwithstanding clause of the Charter to violate rights and freedoms in the context of a labor dispute against education workers. The notwithstanding clause is very concerning. It can be used by any provincial or the federal government to limit almost every right and freedom in the Charter of any person in Canada, including freedom of speech, freedom of the press, protest rights, privacy, equality, liberty, legal rights, life and security of the person, all of these are threatened when the notwithstanding clause is used. And we were concerned that the public needed to be informed about this serious danger and that a public outcry was our strongest weapon against this government overreach. We undertook a large multifaceted public engagement and media campaign. 
CCLA, QP, and many others stood up against the bill, raised our voices, and a few days later, the government agreed to repeal the law. CCLA this past year continues to challenge a regulation that restricts access to abortion in New Brunswick. CCLA this year has been busy working on strip search powers of, of um, correctional officials. Strip searches are a highly intrusive and inherently humiliating practice that psychologically scars prisoners, many of whom have already experienced physical abuse in the past. In Ontario, administrative of Administrative officials can authorize strip searches at any time and in any situation without requiring reasons, suspicion, individualized or other circumstances. CCLA is challenging these powers. The government has responded by initiating some regulatory limits on strip searches. In federal prisons, there are legal limits on suspicionless strip searches, but Canada's federal prisons regularly violate these limits, and these searches have occurred hundreds of thousands of times. CCLA and an Elson Advocacy have launched a class action lawsuit against these violations. CCLA also this year has had various initiatives against racial profiling, including a recent landmark legal victory in Quebec. There, a young Black man and CCLA as a party intervener challenged police powers, broad police powers, to stop cars for no cause or suspicion in a roving stop. Not only are they broad powers, they're hard to monitor for civil society groups. There is almost no accountability and the practice has disproportionately impacted black and other racialized drivers. In this landmark decision, the Quebec Superior Court agreed with our position and struck down these police powers as unconstitutional. The government just announced that they're going to be appealing that decision and CCLA is going to continue to fight. Also, we put out a Know Your Rights Guide on Police Stops and Racial Profiling, an interactive website that we have made available in French and in English. CCLA and CCLET, our educational organization, have conducted workshops with thousands of students, teachers and training and communi community groups, where we teach young people and others to think critically about rights and freedoms. This year, we also held educational conferences across the country in Charlottetown, Calgary, and Victoria. Bill 21, another huge area of activity this past year. Bill 21 is a law that bans religious symbols for many public sector workers in Quebec, teachers, police officers, government lawyers, judges, and others. We have been fighting the law with litigation partners in court since the day after it was enacted three and a half years ago. For those three and a half years, the law has harmed mostly women, most Muslim, many from racialized and immigrant communities, harming their careers, their financial security, their independence, and most of all, their freedoms, their freedom to practice their religion and their free freedom to choose what to wear. Jews, Sikhs, Christians, and others have also been harmed. There are reports of increased harassment and assaults against Muslim women, and many religious minorities report concern about their future in a province where they are no longer equal. This law too, took the egregious step of invoking the notwithstanding clause. And because of that, our attempt to have the law suspended by the court was denied. And the Quebec Superior Court that heard our constitutional challenge, along with other challenges that were later uh, filed, the Quebec Superior Court struck down only a small part of the law. We appealed that decision and we were back before the courts, before the Quebec Court of Appeal this fall, and we're going to keep fighting for people's freedoms and rights. On the right to protest, CCLA successfully appealed a court order against protest in Nova Scotia. There, the provincial government had requested a court order to effectively bar all public protest activity. The government later asked the court to rescind the order, but CCLA said that the issue has to still be heard by the court so that the court can consider the importance of the right to protest and can limit the kind of anti-protest orders that, that courts can issue in the future. We have also continued this year, and this is my last, um, my last case I want to talk about. We have continued to fight for freedom of expression, and we are intervening in two cases in which litigation is being used to silence people, to threaten people in order to stop them for speak, from speaking out. One case concerns the president of the BC Teachers Federation, who called out a trustee for homophobia and was sued for defamation. In another case, a young woman used TikTok to stand up for reproductive freedoms and advise people how to interfere with anti-choice protests. The injunctions in the lawsuits used in both cases are not strong legally, 
But just the threat of a lengthy, expensive legal battle can chill expression, and it does. Freedom of expression is necessary to protect equality, democracy, and public participation. It's necessary to build public support and to hold accountable those in power. So that was a snapshot of some of CCLA's current work. And speaking of democracy, public participation, and accountability, it is now my great honor to introduce my colleague, Kara Faith Zwiebel, who is the director of CCLA Fundamentals Freedom Program. Kara was called to the Ontario Bar in 2005. She earned her LLB from Osgoode Hall and her LLM from New York University. She also clerked at the Supreme Court of Canada. Kara's work with CCLA includes law, research, litigation, and submissions to legislative bodies, as well as public education. And most recently, Kara has represented CCLA at the Emergencies Act inquiry. Welcome, Kara. Thank you, Noah, and thank you to everyone who's joining us today for uh, both for being here, for your ongoing support of the CCLA and the work that we do, and for your interest in this topic. Um, so I'm going to launch right into it, and um, what I'm going to try to cover today, and I'm just checking out the time here, is um, I'm going to try to talk about, first of all, why the CCLA raised concerns about the invocation of the Emergencies Act, um, the, the invocation and declaration of a public order of emergency on February 14th of this year, which, as some of you may remember, was not um, necessarily a popular position with everyone at the time that we took it. Um, I'm also going to talk about why we sought to participate in the Public Order Emergency Commission, which I'll sometimes call the, the commission or the inquiry. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the government's position before the commission and a bit about some of the, the positions of the other parties. I want to highlight a couple of what I think were sort of key moments or issues that arose over the course of the commission. Um, and then just very briefly touch on what we expect from the commission's report um, and, and what comes next. So to start, why, why was CCLA concerned about the invocation of the Emergencies Act and the declaration of a public order emergency? And I, I guess I want to start by clearing up some confusion that I know many people have about CCLA's position. I think some people took the criticism of the government's use of the act, of the Emergencies Act, as um, implicit or tacit support for the, the, the issues being protested or the tactics taken by the protesters. Um, that is not the case. I think that at the time that the, um, the protests in January and February were happening, we at CCLA recognized the very serious harms uh, that were being caused in some cases to, to residents in the communities where those protests were taking place. Um, including allegations of, of racial harassment and assaultive behavior, and also recognized concerns by members of the communities that um, they felt underprotected by the police. The, um, those are important issues, and um, they're issues that I think received some attention, but probably not um, sufficient attention in the inquiry. Um, that's partly because of what the inquiry is was really about, and 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 I'll I'll get to that. But I think for for the CCLA, our concern with the federal government's use of emergency powers is that I mean, emergency legislation is extraordinary. You know, I know during the pandemic, we we all got used to being living in states of emergency at the municipal and provincial level, even though the federal government never declared an emergency um, because of the of the health issues. Um, but the, the reality is that when we use emergency legislation, we're allowing government to bypass the ordinary legislative process um, where we have debate and discussion in the House of Commons, where we have um, you know, voting by elected representatives, what we, where we have sober second thought in, in the Senate. Um, that whole process gets cut out. And instead, what replaces it is rule by executive order, where basically the cabinet gets to rule by fiat. They, uh, they pass orders and those become laws. So there is a real concern about the potential for abuse. And fortunately with the Emergencies Act, there are a lot of safeguards and um, I can take credit without um, boasting here because CCLA, although I was not um, at the CCLA in the 1980s when the Emergencies Act became law, CCLA was really instrumental in making sure that there were some important safeguards built in to the Emergencies Act. 
So, um, for example, one of the things that initially when the Emergencies Act was tabled, uh, the government, for the government to declare an emergency, cabinet had to believe that a national emergency existed. And the CCLA said, you know, believing that an emergency existed is not really much of a standard at all. Um, and so we proposed and it was accepted that that should be changed to reasonable grounds to believe. Um, and the lawyers that are here might recognize that language. It's a um, common language that we use in a whole bunch of different places in the law. But what using those terms means is that uh, an independent judge or third party can take a look and assess the reasonableness of what the government did rather than just saying, well, the government believed it to be the case and that's enough. Um, the Emergencies Act also has parliamentary supervision built into it, and this was something that was lacking in the War Measures Act, which is what the Emergencies Act replaced. And so what that means is that within a relatively short period of time of the federal government declaring an emergency, um, that state of emergency has to be confirmed by both houses of parliament. And in order to facilitate that happening, the government has to put a justification for its decision to invoke the act in front of those houses of parliament. That's called the Section 58 justification. That's what I'm going to call it. It's under Section 58 of the Emergencies Act. And when the CCLA saw the justification that the government was putting forward in this case, we had a lot of concerns. I'm going to talk a little bit later about what the act says. Um, there has to be you know, has to be in place for there to be a public order emergency. Um, but it has to do with, you know, serious threats of violence, uh, concerns about overthrow of the government, um, things of a very significant and high level. The Section 58 justification that the government put forward at the time in February was very heavily focused on the economic disruption and harms that uh, the protests and blockades were causing. Um, it did also talk about the threats of, of serious violence, although um, much of that discussion in the Section 58 justification was of, of what I would call a pretty speculative nature. Um, so sort of, you know, there are concerns this might happen or this might happen, but nothing grounded in evidence or vetted intelligence that, um, that the government could point to. Um, the public order emergency section of the Emergencies Act gives the federal government very broad powers. Um, and, and it's important to understand that the Emergencies Act actually has four different types of emergencies in it. So I mentioned before that the federal government never declared an emergency during you know, the, the pandemic it, dealing with the, the public health issues. If they had, that would have been under the public welfare emergency provisions. And the powers that they have at their disposal are different depending on the type of emergency that's declared. Um, other than a war emergency, I would say that the public order emergency section has the broadest powers and the greatest potential for powers that may abuse or um, restrict or limit charter rights. Uh, so one of the things that um, the government can do when they declare a public order emergency is compel the provision of services. Um, and in the emergency that um, that was declared in February, they they used that to uh, compel uh, tow truck services to assist in uh, in removing vehicles, or or they could have actually even after you know six weeks of hearings in the commission, it's still a bit unclear whether those powers were actually used <laughs> to to force tow truck drivers to to deal with that. Um, one thing that they didn't use, but that was at their disposal under the public order emergency um, section of the act, uh, is that government can take over public utilities. So a pretty um, significant power that the government has at their disposal. The government also has the ability to prohibit or restrict public assemblies. And this is a really significant um, power that the government has. And in fact, when the Emergencies Act was being considered, the CCLA's position was that that particular power should not be included in the act. Um, and it was partly that it was not necessary for the government to have that power because police already do have substantial powers to restrict or prohibit assemblies in certain cases. Um, but that is a power that exists under the act, and it's one that was incorporated into the orders that became the emergency orders that the government used. Um, so. 
why did the CCLA seek to participate in the Public Order Emergency Commission? Um, the commission was an opportunity for an impartial and thorough examination of what happened, um, and particularly in light of our concerns about the Section 58 justification that I mentioned, we wanted to not just hear the government's evidence, but also participate in probing that evidence and in questioning the government witnesses that would come forward about the process that they engaged in before deciding to take the step of um, invoking the act for the first time in, in its history and using these extraordinary powers that were at their disposal. Um, another thing that became clear when the government released the, the order and council that established the commission was that they were focused a fair bit on things like um, the, the circumstances that led up to the protests. And our concern was that while, while that's a very important thing to examine, um, the commission is also, um, and in our view, substantially about holding the government to account for its actions. And so we wanted to make sure that, you know, a significant part of the commission's focus was on what the government did and its reasons for doing it. Now, unlike most commissions of inquiry um, under the Emergencies Act, there is a deadline for laying a report before parliament. And, um, and as a result, the commission was working on a very abridged timeframe. Um, so it, had a lot to try and deal with in a very short period of time. Uh, it didn't help that the government waited almost the, the full 60 days that it could to appoint the commission, which was 60 days lost as far as the commission's work goes. So as a result, um, the, there were in the end six weeks of evidentiary or fact-finding hearings where the commission was hearing directly from witnesses that could be cross-examined and questioned. Um, and one week of policy roundtables, and its report is due um, at, towards the end of February. Um, so I want to talk just now briefly about the, the thrust of the Government of Canada's position uh, in, the, in the Commission. And I think even though I'm going to talk about the government's position, um, I think it's fair to say that there were, based on the evidence that the Commission heard, different ministers within the government had different understandings of first of all, what was happening on the ground across the country, and also different understandings of the legal threshold that had to be met under the Act. The government's position generally was that um, this the, the protests had become a national issue because there were protests and blockades taking place at um, ports of entry across the country. And, um, and even though there was no evidence that um, there was no evidence that really established that these things were um, coordinated, and even in the course of the commission, it became clear that they actually were not coordinated in any formal sense. They were certainly loosely related or connected to one another. Um, as far as the you know the, the position of the government as to why they required these emergency powers, um, I mentioned before that there was some some information in the Section 58 justification about the potential for violence. The way the witnesses and the commission talked about this was again in fairly speculative terms. Um, they acknowledged that most of the people that were involved in the protest were not um, extremists uh, in terms of um, violent extremists, were not people who were, um, who were planning to engage in acts of serious violence, uh, but they did say there were you know, individuals in the crowd who may have had those tendencies. There was also a concern that um, the sort of chaos created by these large protests and blockades would be used by a lone wolf attacker to, to sort of, to, to their benefit, to, to launch a, a violent attack. Um, there was also the possibility that these events would attract people, would be used by um, violent extremists to recruit. Uh, but again, all of those, um, all of all of that evidence was really um, framed in in fairly speculative terms, um, and we did hear from you know um, intelligence officers in police forces. We heard from uh, intelligence officers with the Canadian um, the Canadian Security uh, Intelligence Service, um, so CSIS, um, and and really. Um, 
it, it remained fairly speculative. The one non-speculative piece, which many of you probably heard about, was that there were some arrests that happened in Coots, Alberta, the blockade there, where a cache of weapons was, was found in a trailer and uh, a number of people were arrested. And um, I mean, the, the criminal trial of that is, is, still, is still to come. Uh, but there is there there are charges that um, those individuals were planning to engage in acts of violence, most likely against um, police officers. Um, th the government also was feeling that um, first of all there was they were hearing from law enforcement that there were issues with towing the trucks because tow trucks were not willing to um, to help either because they didn't want to. Um, they didn't want to help the government out. They had sympathies with the protesters or because they felt they had been um, threatened by protesters that if they did help out, they would suffer consequences. The government was also very concerned about the amount of funding that the protesters had at their disposal. The crowdfunding, um, you know, had had reached millions of dollars. And that was really what was allowing people to to stay put for so long because they are fuel and their food and things like that could be covered by some of those funds. But the, the other thing that came through very clearly in the commission is that at the highest levels of government um, and, and uh, you know, among civil servants who were in uh, positions that um, were involved in influencing, I, I would say, the decision making process, there was a complete lack of loss of confidence in the ability of the police to um, to bring these blockades to an end. Um, and, you know, I think there's a whole host of reasons why that was the case. Um, but, you know, one significant issue is that um, there are, and we, we've, we've heard this in other commissions of inquiry, there are always concerns about the relationship between the government and police. Um, we always want to make sure that, you know, police are able to operate independently and autonomously. Um, but there's also a need to make sure that, uh, you know, the government is held accountable for the actions of state agencies, which include law enforcement. And um, a lot of government actors were very concerned about not being seen to direct the police, because we've heard in, in past inquiries that that is something that governments should not do. They should not be directing the operations of police. The problem here, I think, is that the, the government became so concerned about not crossing that line um, that ultimately what they felt they couldn't do directly, they did indirectly by invoking the Emergencies Act. Because what the Emergencies Act effectively did was give the police a whole bunch of new powers. And I think in a very public way, convey to law enforcement, we want you to use these powers right now to deal with these protests. Um, the government's position also before the commission was that it worked, that they brought in the Emergencies Act and the orders, and within about a week, the protests had been cleared, these public order operations by police had happened, and things had were, were coming to a resolution. Um, now, obviously, that is, um, from my perspective, an, an ends justifies the means kind of argument, and not one that, that I'm in favor of. Um, there's certainly lots of things that um, government might be very effective at if they had all the power that they wanted. But again, we want to, to hold them accountable and make sure that they're not um, intruding unnecessarily into the rights and freedoms of people in Canada. Um, and again, most law enforcement officers that we heard from during the course of the commission's hearings um, agreed that they, they found the orders under the Emergency Act helpful. Um, although many of them acknowledged those, those powers were not necessary. And that, again, is an important distinction for us because there are a lot of powers that would be helpful to the police. Um, but from our concern about respecting the rights and freedoms of people in Canada, we want to make sure that the powers that we give to law enforcement are necessary and proportional. Um, so our submissions before the commission were that the... Um, the invocation of the act was not justified and the emergency powers were too broad. Um, and there's, we, we have uh, closing written submissions that are now on the Public Order Emergency Commission website um, that you can read in more detail. Um, but I wanna, I know I'm, I'm already running uh, short on time. I wanna talk about um, a couple of key moments and, and there's two in particular that I wanna discuss. The first has to do with the role of 
the provincial government in Ontario. Um, and the, there was evidence early on in the hearings uh, of the commission about um, Ontario's absence, the government of Ontario's absence from meetings and discussions about how to deal with these disruptive protests and blockades and occupations that were taking place, uh, particularly in Ottawa at the time. The OPP at the law enforcement level was involved in coordinating and working with the Ottawa Police Service. But at the political level, um, there was a clear evidence of real reluctance by um, the Premier, the Solicitor General in Ontario to, to get involved in discussions. And um, as a result of that, CCLA and two other groups that had party status before the Commission wrote to the Commission saying that we felt that, the, that Premier Ford and former Solicitor General Sylvia Jones should be called to testify before the Commission. Um, we then received word from the Commission that um, this was something that the Commission had been trying to facilitate for some time. Um, and despite the fact that the Premier had, had at this time recently made statements that he was not appearing before the Commission because he hadn't been asked to appear, um, we learned that, in fact, he had been asked to appear and had declined. Um, ultimately, as a result of these um, this correspondence, the commission decided to subpoena uh, Premier Ford and former Solicitor General Jones. Um, and that subpoena was challenged by um, the Premier and Minister uh, on the basis of parliamentary privilege. So there is a, um, a sort of rule that um, you don't call elected officials away from their duties in the Legislative Assembly to attend uh, judicial proceedings. They can choose to do that, but they can't be compelled to do it. Um, and so they were successful, unfortunately, in defeating the subpoena. Um, and so as a result, there is, in my view, a gap of, of information and knowledge that the commission um, has. And this is important because the definition of a national emergency is something that exceeds the authority and capacity of provinces. And so although we did get some evidence from some provincial um, uh, officials at, at the, the civil servant level, um, I think there was an important piece missing. Another really significant point has to do with um, the definition of a public order emergency. Um, and it's a bit complicated, but um, I'm gonna try to be as, as brief about it as I can. One of the things that uh, the government has to establish uh, to say that there is a public order emergency is that um, there is a threat to the security of Canada. And that phrase is defined in the Emergencies Act by referencing the CSIS Act. Um, and the CSIS Act defines threats to the security of Canada um, in, in a very specific way. Um, it includes things like espionage or sabotage, um, covert foreign interference, um, and acts of serious acts or threats of serious violence against persons or property, um, often sort of shorthanded as, as acts of terrorism. Um, so that definition, um, and it was a deliberate decision when the Emergencies Act was being drafted and passed to tie the definition of threats to the security of Canada to the CSIS Act. So it didn't reproduce the language from the CSIS Act, it actually just referred to it, which meant that if the definition in the CSIS Act changed, the definition in the Emergencies Act would change as well. That was something that was done intentionally. Um, now, one of the things that was significant over the course of the Commission's work is that we, we heard from uh, the director of CSIS, um, and early on we got a, a summary of the, the interview that the director of CSIS had had with Commission Council. And in that interview summary, it was clear that the director of CSIS had determined at the time that there was no threat to the security of Canada within the meaning of the CSIS Act, in his opinion. Um, and he felt it was important to communicate that information to members of cabinet when they were deciding whether to invoke the Emergencies Act. Ultimately, um, there was a, a hearing that was held outside of the view of the public and outside of the view of the parties, what we call an in-camera hearing, where only counsel for the commission and counsel for the government were there. And that's because there was some potentially um, sensitive national security information that could be discussed. 
Um, and then we received a summary of that hearing. And in that summary, we learned that despite finding, despite believing that there was no threat to the security of Canada within the meaning of the CSIS Act, the director of CSIS, upon being asked by the prime minister whether he thought the prime minister should invoke the Emergencies Act, said he thought he should. Um, and then when we ultimately got an opportunity to question the director of CSIS uh, in the public hearings, uh, we learned that the director of CSIS had gone to the Department of Justice and sought a legal opinion on whether threats to the security of Canada meant the same thing in the Emergencies Act as it does in the CSIS Act, and was told that it could mean something different. Um, this was a, um, a surprise, I guess, uh, to, to understate it, a surprise to us um, who, were, who were involved in the, uh, in the commission, and an important piece of information. And, um, and significantly, that legal advice is something that the commission and the parties do not have access to. It is subject to the privilege that people have with their lawyers, in this case, the privilege that the government has with its lawyers, the Department of Justice. Um, and so as a result, that is another, I think, significant missing piece and something that is um, important. Having said that, um, you know, the, the government's legal advice to itself about whether it can arrogate to itself these extraordinary powers is also of limited use. And um, in some ways, I think it's important that the commissioner will have an opportunity to assess for himself whether, um, you know, what threats to the security of Canada in the Emergencies Act means. And in our view, it means exactly what it says, which is uh, it refers to the CSIS Act definition. So I know I'm, um, I'm running out of time. I'm just going to mention briefly that the, the report of the commission is um, supposed to be tabled before Parliament by February 20th. Um, we expect a lengthy document that will address a whole broad range of issues and make findings of fact both about what happened and recommendations about what is uh, to come and what should happen in the future. Um, you know, a, a couple of people while in, in my personal life while I was doing this work were asking me, you know, so what happens in the end? What, where does this, what does this all mean? And the answer is a bit anticlimactic because the truth is what it means is we're going to get a, a long report with some important findings. Um, but of course, what's done is done. And so we, we had an emergency declared. We lived under emergency orders for a short period of time. Um, I think what's important about the commission's work is that it allowed for a process where um, individuals could hear from government witnesses, could view government documents. And despite the gaps in transparency that I've already mentioned, there was a, a an extraordinary amount of information disclosed in the course of this commission. And that is a really important um, process and, and really was unprecedented in many respects. Um, so CCLA will be continuing obviously to pay attention to this, um, to this issue, we'll, we'll be watching for the Commission's report and commenting on, on its recommendations and its findings. And we also have an ongoing judicial review challenging the, um, the decision to invoke the Act, which um, is going to be continuing in, in the new year. So I'm going to stop um, there for my, um, my sort of prepared remarks. And I know there are some questions that have come in, so I'm going to try to address those now. Um, so uh, one is whether I foresee uh, the fight against the notion of medical mandates continuing in the future. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's it's hard to know. I think one of the things, and this is sort of one of the things that um, was left unsaid, I guess, during the course of the commission's work, is that, you know, as much as there was, um, uh, people are very divided on this issue and the, um, the, the protests and the um, the different sort of sides that people took as to whether this was a justified use of the Emergencies Act, sometimes divided up on those lines. I think the government also learned that um, these issues around uh, not just mandates, but the, the level of intrusion that people experienced to their lives during the pandemic was something that was very concerning to many Canadians. And so even though I think, you know, there was a view that um, this was a fringe group, I know that the prime minister at the very beginning of the protest described this as a fringe minority. 
Um, and, and certainly, you know, it's a fringe minority that was prepared to, to blockade border crossings and, and to um, spend three weeks living in a truck in downtown Ottawa. Um, there were a lot of Canadians that donated money and that stood by the side of the road waving to these trucks because they did feel they weren't ready to take those steps, but they did feel that the government had gone too far in some respects, and they did feel a need to push back in one way or another. Um, and I think we've been we've seen less willingness by governments across the country to go back to um, some of the mandates. You know, uh, I know there was a, a lot of discussion uh, here in Ontario about uh, mask mandates and things like that. There still is. But I think those the protests are in the back of people's minds, um, recognizing that there are people for whom this is a really big deal. And, um, and you know, we, we need to weigh their alienation in, in decisions about what to do. Um, so, so I don't know. Um, I don't know if we'll see it again. Um, I think for now, as long as, um, fingers crossed, things remain relatively under control, pandemic-wise, although I know many people would say it's, it's already out of control. Um, I, I think we're probably not going to see governments that are very keen to um, to engage in, you know, to, to mandate things uh, without without really clear um, evidence of, of need. Um, okay, I'm gonna go to another question. Um, so someone's asking whether the government could have been asked or compelled by the commission, uh, by Justice Rouleau, to waive privilege and answer specific questions about the legal advice it received to justify in the invocation of the Emergencies Act. So the, the short answer is uh, is no, they could not have been compelled to, um, to waive solicitor client privilege. Um, there, there was probably a process that could have happened where um, uh, it, it would have involved going to an outside court, it would have not been able to be completed in the time that, um, you know, that the commission had to, to do its work. Um, but but no, ultimately, Justice Rouleau um, doesn't have the power to tell the government that it has to disclose legal advice. Um, you know, there, there are, I think, there were arguments that um, the government had arguably waived uh, privilege by having witnesses testify and say, well, I understood that the definition was different and my understanding was based on a, a legal opinion that I got from the Department of Justice. So I think there were arguments that um, that had been arguably waived, although the, the government was quick to, um, to make it clear that the witnesses who gave those answers were not authorized to waive privilege on behalf of the government. Um, and you know what? Although it is frustrating that we can't get this, this information, um, it's also, you know, solicitor client privilege is a very important principle and one that we we often fight to, to protect because it's um, really crucial to the, the relationship of, of people to their lawyers that they know that what they tell them is, is going to be confidential and cannot be disclosed unless they give permission for it to be disclosed. It is a little more complicated when we're talking about the advice that the government gets from its own lawyers, um, and that's you know that's something that um, that actually we've we've talked about in some other cases. Um, a few years ago, there was a um, a Department of Justice lawyer who um, who actually brought a challenge to the the way in which the Department of Justice sort of assesses the constitutionality of legislation, and um, there is a requirement under the Department of Justice Act that the Minister of Justice, before legislation gets tabled, um, determine that nothing in the legislation is not compliant with the Charter. Um, and we learned through this a lawyer from the Department of Justice that uh, the way that they assess that is by deciding whether there is any credible argument that could be made to support the constitutionality of the legislation. Um, even if it's one that the government, you know, government lawyers looking at it objectively think is highly unlikely to um, convince a judge. Um, if there is any credible argument, um, they will say that it is consistent with the charter. So it's a, it's a pretty low bar. Um, so I guess, you know, there is, uh, while it would be nice to look at that legal opinion and see what the Department of Justice said, 
I, I do expect that it it's also potentially a bit of a self-serving opinion and that, um, you know, if if the Department of Justice understood that the federal government was looking at whether they could justify invoking the Emergencies Act, they would construct a legal opinion that would try to facilitate that. Um, and I don't say that to impugn anyone's that, I mean, that that is part of a lawyer's job is to find the legal arguments that could be made to support what the client wants to do. Um, okay, and I'm gonna, sorry, gonna look at some other questions here. Um, Okay, so this one's not really related to um, the Emergencies Act, but someone's asking about whether I foresee a lot of work on freedom of expression with the upcoming internet bills before Parliament now. Um, so yes, um, the, you know, the uh, the bills that are before Parliament now do definitely have freedom of expression implications. The bills that we're expecting in the future that deal with um, sort of online harms or online safety will definitely be things that will um, or raise issues around freedom of expression. So it's something that we're, we're watching for very closely. Um, and so, okay, and then this, the next question is, was there scientific and medical justification for the vaccine mandates themselves, which gets at the use of mis and disinformation in support of mandates and one of the reasons the protest began in the first place? And the question is, does the CCLA feel this aspect was covered by the by the commission? Um, so this was one of the things that the commission was asked by the government to do is look at the role of misinformation and disinformation in the protests um, and, uh, you know, and consider that. I think the, the commission didn't really get much of an opportunity to do that. Um, I mean, it, it heard from protesters and some of them, if if you watch some of their testimony, I think certainly some of them demonstrated that they were relying on bad information um, in making certain decisions. Um, there was, uh, I mentioned a policy roundtable. Um, there was a policy roundtable discussion about um, misinformation and disinformation, but it was a little bit more abstract and not not directly linked to sort of how, how it played out during the, the, the protests. Um, you know, I think it's a, it's a really messy, it's a really messy area. And, you know, the truth is that um, if you looked at all of the evidence that the commission had, um, there was misinformation coming from all sides, you know, including from, from the government. Um, there was, uh, and, and I say that misinformation um, it is sometimes distinguished from disinformation, um, where disinformation is sort of intentionally misleading. Misinformation doesn't have to be intentionally misleading. It could just be uh, that you've made a mistake. But, um, you know, I, I remember this is a small example, but I remember looking at some of the, there, there were text messages exchanged between, um, you know, ministers and their, and their chiefs of staff, for example. Uh, and I remember in particular, a, a message from one of the prime minister's staffers, about how the police had said that they were not going to allow fuel fuel canisters into you know the downtown core in Ottawa, um, they were stopping that. Um, but the staffer was was posting was sharing an article that said um, you know people were bringing their, they they were seeing tons of protesters with fuel canisters. So we learned over the course of the commission that at some point uh, protesters decided to fill jerry cans with water so they could make it look like they were being allowed to bring in fuel, even though they weren't. And, um, you know, I mean, that's an example of, of misinformation that got spread. It wasn't, uh, there was no intention to, uh, you know, by the, by the people reporting it, they, they believe genuinely that there was fuel there. But um, this was a, just a really messy, um, you know, a, a very um, uh, messy protest. There were lots of, of different people involved, lots of different groups. There was no cohesive sort of ideology or group um, amongst the protesters. People were there for all different reasons. Um, it, it started out about mandates, but for many people that wasn't the issue. Um, there were all sorts of other issues. Um, so no, I mean, I don't think that that was an issue that um, that was really thoroughly addressed over the course of the commission's work. And I think given 
the amount of time that it had and all of the other issues that it was asked to look at, it, it probably couldn't be. Um, okay, and I, I know we're short on time. I'm going to try and take one more. Um, Um, so someone's asking whether I can speculate on what the commissioner might rule and what the consequences would be if he um, if he determined that the the government did not have the legal authority. Um, you know, I think um, I I won't I have no idea what the, what the commissioner will do. I think he was very good at, at being um, fair and impartial throughout the, the proceedings. I think he did demonstrate that he was troubled by some by some of the uh, the scope of some of the emergency orders and and in particular the fact that um, you know at least looking at the emergency orders on their face, they didn't necessarily allow for um, you know peaceful protests not involving vehicles, not involving blockades to continue. Um, there was, you know, a decision once the Emergencies Act was invoked that things needed to be cleared and even pedestrian uh, protesters were not going to be allowed to stay in those places. So um, I, I think, you know, ultimately that will be um, damaging, I think, to the government if the if the commissioner finds that the legal authority was not there. Um, but the truth is that I think, you know, what the government um from a political standpoint, the government is concerned about what Canadians think they should have done. And invoking the act was very popular and remains very popular. So um, I think they may feel that they've already sort of won that battle. It will be a loss for them if the commission finds that they weren't authorized, but I think that um, they may not care that much about that. <laughs> um, all right, I, I'm supposed to stop at 3.55, so I'm going to stop and hand things back to Noah. And just again, I want to thank people for um, for your interest and for participating today. Thank you so much, Kara. This was such an insightful and, and inspiring and um, exciting presentation, even though it's about a difficult topic. And, and thank you also for really all your hard work over the past year leading up to the inquiry and during the hearings. Um, we thank your kids for really giving you up for that time. I want to thank everybody here for joining us for this event. I know we didn't get to all of the questions. The one thing I do want to say is that we are challenging uses of the notwithstanding clause. We are looking for ways to challenge it. It's Bill 21. We challenged that law within less than 24 hours after it was enacted. Uh, we continue to challenge other laws and, and we take every tool that we can in the toolbox. But to get rid of the notwithstanding clause, you'd need a constitutional amendment. So there's that. Anyway, I want to thank you all for joining us, for your support throughout the year. Many of you are already donors to the CCLA's work, and I want to thank you very much for ensuring that we're able to take on issues like the government's use of the Emergencies Act and continuing our other important rights and freedoms to work. If you've never made a donation to CCLA or if you haven't given yet this year, please consider making a donation before December 31st. I want to thank you for participating today. We hope to see you all at our next event in March. That one is going to be on privacy and technology, and it's going to coincide with a major international conference in Toronto that we are hosting at that time. Uh, major, not necessarily in size, but in terms of the weight and the uh, expertise of the people that are coming. So stay tuned for our event in March, and thank you again. It's lovely to see you all here.